Uh, today, we, we begin a brand new series called The Power of Habit. In fact, uh, this book that I read by, by that title, it's called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. Uh, great book. It is the number one business book across the nation. Not that I would want to bring a business book to say uh, you ought to be reading a business book, but there are some lot of truths in this that I think have biblical application. And so uh, uh, today, just by the title, The Power of Habit, uh, he, he says this, Charles Duhigg says this in the book, that a habit consists of three steps. One, it begins with a cue. A cue is simply this. Uh, it, it, a cue is just tells your brain to go in automatic mode. That I don't think about this, it just happens, okay? That, that's a cue. Then there's a routine. Routine can be physical, emotional, or mental. And so that there's a routine that you follow. And the third is the reward. The reward says that my brain tells me I want to keep this loop I, and I want to know that, that I'm going to keep this loop and I'm going to follow this loop because this becomes the habit. And I told you last week that you have a habit. You have a lot of habits. You, you have a lot of habits in your life. For example, when you got up this morning, you showered or you bathed the same way. Uh, gentlemen, you, you shaved the same way that you shave, if you shave. Ladies, you put your makeup on the same way. You, you do it the same way every morning because it is a habit, and you follow the, the same loop. If you try and mess with that loop, it messes you up. And some of you said, I, I try to do it different. Man, it really messed me up. Uh, you know, it, it, it really did. Well, the definition of insanity is doing, repeatedly doing the same thing, expecting different results. I told you last week that does sound like a Baptist church, but I, I, I recognize that, that we try and do the same thing, think we're going to get different results. That's not true. Habits have to change. And when a habit does change, Charles Duhigg says in his book that if you change one habit, that it has a residual effect, has a ripple effect to the rest of your life. For example, someone who says, now I'm going to run a mile a day, suddenly discovers that if I run a mile a day and that becomes my habit, now all of a sudden my eating habits begin to change. My water intake begins to change. My sleep habits begin to change. It has a ripple effect because I've created this habit. That's why Rick Warren has been so successful at Saddleback Church with his 40-day programs. He, he calls his 40 days, 40 days of community, 40 days of being in God's Word, uh, it, just a lot of different 40 days of prayer. And, and the reason he does is because he's discovered that it takes 40 days for something to become a habit for your life. If you'll do it consistently for 40 days, it becomes habit forming. And, and so would you make prayer a habit for 40 days and hopefully become a habit of your life? Today, that's what I want to talk to you about is prayer. And, and the habits I want to talk to us about are our spiritual habits. And I pray that you change at least one of these in your life because it will have a residual effect, have a ripple effect to every other area of your life. Why not begin the new year with a new habit of prayer? Why prayer? Because prayer undergirds everything that we do. Prayer is the beginning and the end of everything we do. It, it is not the, the last-ditch effort. It's the first response. And for our theme uh, for this entire series I want to use a scripture verse, and I want to say one thing to you. Chris Hodges, who's a pastor in, in Alabama, made this statement. Most people have uphill hopes, but downhill habits. I believe that's true of us. Do you agree? Most of us have uphill hopes, but we have downhill habits. I pray our habits do change, especially our spiritual habits. And here's the theme verse for our series. Ephesians 3, 16 and 17 says this. I pray that from his glorious, unlimited resources, his glorious and unlimited resources, he, God, will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust him. Your roots will grow down into God's love and keep you strong. That's my prayer, is that you, the habits you form, the spiritual habits that you deepen form roots that go down into God's love, and those roots will keep you strong in the face of life, in everything that you do. So why not make prayer a habit? In about a month, one of my favorite times of the year begins. February begins. Players report to spring training in baseball. I love baseball. I'm a baseball guy. They, they report to spring training. If you were to ask a Major League Baseball manager, what is it going to take for you to win a World Series, they will say the same thing. It takes pitching, pitching, and more pitching. Pl teams will give their top dollar for pitchers unless your team is the Texas Rangers. 
but they will give the top dollar for pitching. They, they, they'll do that. Billy Graham was at a gathering of pastors, international gathering of pastors, about 10, to, about 10 years ago. And he was interviewed, and he was asked, what does it take for a ministry or a church to be successful and to be ongoing and to be lasting? And he said this, it takes prayer, prayer, and more prayer. You see, prayer is, is the beginning and the ending point. Just as pitching is to baseball, prayer is to your spiritual life. It is. Without prayer, you will not be successful. Without prayer, you will not have a viable, valuable, or victorious life, ministry, whatever. You, you, won't, you just won't. Prayer undergirds, undergirds everything. A church's ministry rises no higher than the prayers of its people. If it is a prayerless church, it is a purposeless church. If it's a prayerless life, it's, it becomes a, a, a fragmented life. A life that's full of confusion. Well, Jesus made prayer a priority. He absolutely did. Prayer was the center focus of his life. And in Matthew 26 was a defining moment in the life of Jesus. Matthew 26 and the other Gospels recorded as well. But Jesus has a personal struggle. Am I going to follow God's will or am I not? Listen to, to what he prays. Matthew 26, verses 36 to 46. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, took them along with him, and he began to be sorrowful and troubled. And then he said to them, My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. Going a little farther, he fell, he fell with his face to the ground, and he prayed, My father, if it is possible, for this, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Then he, returned to, then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Couldn't you men keep watch with me for just one hour, he asked. And he, he looked at Peter when he asked that. He always looked at Peter when he asked that. Always looked at Peter first. Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We know that. He went away a second time and he prayed, My father, if it is not possible for this cup to be taken away unless I drink it, may your will be done. When he came back, he, he, he again found them sleeping because, as you know, it must have been a Baptist church, their eyes were heavy. Yeah. He said to them, uh, he, so, so he left them, he went away once more and a third time saying the same thing, praying the same thing. Then he returned to his disciples and he said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. And the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he's praying. He's praying. You know, it's called the Mount of Olives. And it's, it's indicative to its name because it's covered with olive trees. This beautiful, beautiful garden area is, is absolutely gorgeous. And it's covered with, with these beautiful olive trees that basically live hundreds and hundreds of years. Well, somewhere in that garden, Jesus is with his three disciples that he loves so much, and he's praying. You discover that when Jesus went away to pray, that uh, as he was praying, he began to feel the weight of the world on his shoulders. What, what was that weight? It was your sin. It was my sin. The sinless now was encountering, discovering, I am going to take on sin. And, and it was disturbing to him. It was beyond disturbing. It, it, it was, well shattering shattering to him you see jesus is battling his will versus god's will and we tend to think that jesus didn't ever really battled his own will yeah jesus is human fully human he knew exactly what crucifixion was going to be he had seen crucifixions he knew exactly what what it would do to him and he was battling his will do i take on the sin of the world and go through crucifixion and endure the pain, because I think we just kind of slide through that. Church, I, I don't know about you, but if I walk through my yard, I get a sticker, I go to the ground. It hurts. I have no pain tolerance. You know, it hurts. Jesus knew what it would be to have a nail through the feet and a nail through the hands. He, he knew that, what, what that would be like. And he said, I don't want this. I don't want this. Would you? 
I, I don't want this. But God, I don't want my will. I want yours. And he's struggling with that. He's struggling with that. Luke's account says that he struggled so much it just absolutely exhausted him that Luke says uh, an angel of the Lord came and strengthened him because he was so exhausted. And twice Jesus got up to check on his disciples, and both times they're sleeping. Both times they're sleeping. That's why I said it must be a Baptist church. It just kind of just kind of check out. And both times he reminds them, you watch and you pray. You watch, you stay awake and you pray. The spirit, spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. We know that. That's where we live. What, what do we take from this? I mean, what, what do we take from this account? I think three things that, that we learn here. If we're going to make prayer a priority, if we're going to make prayer a habit for this year, then first you understand prayer is priority. For Jesus, he set the example, prayer is priority. Luke 22, verse 39 says, and he came, he came out and he went as was his custom. In other words, he didn't just do it once. It was his custom. He came out and he went as was his custom to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. As was his custom. Is it your custom to pray? Because, see, Jesus went out to the Mount of Olives as was his custom. That's where he went all the time to pray. It, it, was, it was a common thing that he did. It wasn't just once in a while. It wasn't just, oh, I need to do this the first of the week. It was a common thing that he did. Daily experience. How about you? Is prayer something that's common? Is prayer something you truly believe in? Or is it just a church thing? Is it just a pre-meal thing? What, what is prayer? What is prayer for you? Michael Green shared a great story. I, I love this. Michael Green. Anybody grew up in West Texas? Anybody in West, West Texas? Anybody? My wife grew up in West Texas. Yeah, I grew up in Brownwood. West Texas, small, small community was dry. We're not talking about the weather. Okay? It was dry. But the, uh, the ordinance changed, and now it became wet. And as soon as it became wet, the tavern was built. Church got angry about it, so they held an all-night prayer meeting that God would remove the tavern. And as, as luck happened, <laughs> while they were praying, lightning struck the tavern, burned it to the ground. Well, you know what happened? The owner of the tavern said, the church is responsible. He filed a lawsuit against the church. <laughs> yeah. The church said, we are not responsible. So the church, you know what they did? They didn't pray. They got hired a lawyer and, counter, and countersued him. and said, no, we're not responsible. We're not responsible. I love the response of the judge in the case. The response of the judge in the case said, no matter how, how this case comes out, one thing is clear. The tavern owner believes in prayer, and the Christians do not. <laughs> I love that. I love that. My question to you is, do you believe in prayer? Do you make it a priority? I mean, I know it's a church thing to sit here and say, yeah, I believe in prayer. Boy, is it a priority? Did you pray before you came here today? Is the only time you prayed is when Matt was praying during the songs. Is that, that the only time you prayed? Is it a priority? It was to Jesus. Do you believe that all things can be made known from your heavenly Father to the person who consistently prays? Do you consistently pray? Then make it a habit. Make it a habit. I challenge you, 40 days. 40 days. They say, well, that, that's just over a month. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Every day, why not start your day with prayer? Make it a priority. Secondly, prayer must take the priority over my personal preference. Prayer has to take priority over my personal preference because if I don't pray, I'm going to follow my personal preference. And we all have our preferences, don't we? We all have our biases. We all have our preferences. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 26, verse 39. He said, My Father, if it is possible for this cup to be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Yet not as I will, as you will. The nine most important words ever spoken. Yet not as I will, but as you will. Some of you are counting those words now to make sure they're nine. Yeah, there's nine. Nine significant words. You see, if, if I don't pray, then I just have my opinion. And I know there's some of you in the room today that you have high opinion of your opinions. I, I get that. I get that. I, I think there's a lot of us that, that live there, that we feel like we're, we're right, we're pretty good. And guess what? You probably are pretty good, but you're not best. God's way is always best. It, it, it always is. If I don't pray, then I'm just kind of self-motivated. I just follow my own desires. If I don't pray, 
Do you pray about life? Do you pray about your life? Do you pray for your family? Do you pray for people that don't know Jesus Christ? I mean, what, what do you pray for? I have in my office, I have a card that I, I tape in front of me that I see every day. And I wrote on the card, this is what I pray. I pray for this daily. I pray for my wife and my children, and my grandchildren daily, every day. I pray for this church daily, every day. I pray for our search team, the, the worship search team, by name, each name, daily. I pray for our staff by name daily. Pray for them every day. I pray for our, our future worship leader, who, whoever that will be, that God will lead us to that person daily. Pray for our, our future children's minister daily, e every day. Pray, pray for that. I pray for my own heart that God protects me as the leader of this church daily. And that, that's just some, some of the things that, that, I, that I pray for. I also pray that God leads me to someone to share my faith with daily daily i'm curious have you ever prayed any prayer like that i mean are you even willing to have a spiritual conversation with someone does that make you so nervous you oh no i'll talk about the weather i'll talk about the cowboys i'll talk about that horrible injury last night i'll talk about if you saw the cowboy game you know what i'm talking about if if i i'll talk about my church I mean, I want to just keep it real clean and neat and safe because this is what I know. But if I am talking to them about a spiritual conversation, they may ask me something I don't know. And I, oh, no. Guess what? If you pray and you ask God to put someone in your path, he will do that. He will do that. And he'll do it a lot because God's got a sense of humor. <laughs> he does. He does. He, he'll bring them to you. I love Sam Shoemaker. Sam Shoemaker pastored in New York City the early part of the 20th century. And Sam Shoemaker uh, would, would just evangelist. I mean, that's just uh, no, no other way to describe it. He pastored, and his heart was evangelism. And he would go to people, begin to share Christ, and people in New York would say, I don't want to hear any of that. I don't even believe in God. Just get away from me. And this is what he would do. He would say, look, uh, I, I don't care if you don't believe in God. That's okay. I, this is what I want you to do. Would you be willing to pray for 30 days? You don't have to pray to God. Would you be willing to pray for 30 days and just pray this prayer? He said, I do want you to mention God's name. Even if you don't believe in him, God, meet me at my point of deepest need. Just pray that for 30 days. And the people would say, yeah. His biographer said more than 1,000 people came to know Christ because he did that. It, that, that style of evangelism has become known as 30-day experiment. The 30-day experiment. Because you know this, someone who's far from God... Their deepest need, their greatest need is Jesus Christ. And so God will begin to draw them to him. He'll put people in their path. They'll hear things that draw him, draw that person to God. So my question is, do you ask God to ever speak to you to where you might be able to share Christ with someone? Man, what an opportunity. You see, the way you share Christ, what has God done for you? So I guess the real question in the room is, have you ever prayed a prayer to receive Jesus Christ? Man, how terrible would it be that you could go through 2019 and not know Jesus Christ, not come into a relationship with him? Man, I encourage you, talk about that. Ask the question, I would love to share Jesus with you today. I can't think of a better way to start your year. Well, prayer has to take priority. I just have my personal preferences. And by the way, my, my preference may be good, but it may not be best. God's way is always best. Jesus believed in the priority of prayer over his personal preferences. I want to show you something in this passage where, uh, I mean, the reading of this passage really bothers me. I had to read it over and over and over again to finally get, get to this. I don't know why I just never even thought about this. Jesus went back to prayer three times. I mean, it's not like uh, he went into a prayer closet, set, set it for a time or for an hour, and said, okay, I did my hour, I'm done. No, he went back over and over again and over again and he continued to pray to say god i i want your will not mine but i don't want to do this make it another way any way but this and he came down to say okay not my will but as you will you know why is it we think that just one prayer is enough sometimes you have to pray it through to get a clear understanding of god's will and you need to pray it over and over and over again for God to, to maybe answer your prayer. 
I have a sweet lady. She's gone home to be with the Lord. Her name was Lois Warren. She's a church that I pastored. She had a son who drugs, theft, spent years in prison. She prayed for him over and over and over again. And it was this cycle, this uphill cycle, downhill cycle, uphill, downhill. He, he was good and then he was bad, good and bad. And she continued to pray for him. 21 years she prayed for that boy. And James, in prison, gave his life to Christ. And out of prison, <laughs> he, he came out of prison after giving his life to Christ, as you realize, once you give your life to Christ, the, the old self still creeps up. Yeah, he came to one of our small groups and stole three people's wallets. Yeah, I don't even know how you do that. <laughs> He's good. <laughs> so, stole three people's wallets. He went back to jail, came out of jail, came back, and, and came before the church and said, this is what I did, and I'm sorry, and I'm trying to follow God. And I, I really want to follow God, but I have old habits. Anybody have an old habit? You know what he's doing today? He's leading worship at that church. He's, he, he plays in the band and said helps lead worship in that church. And he's not stealing wallets anymore. Thank goodness. Yeah, because, because a faithful mom prayed for him 21 years. A faithful prayer of watching him go up and down and up and down. Sometimes you have to pray it through. This, I've always been impressed with Martin Luther. Always have, and I've always been intimidated by Martin Luther because of statements like this. He said this, If I fail to spend two hours in prayer each morning, the devil gets the victory through the day. I have so much business I cannot get on without spending three hours daily in prayer. Now see, when I read that, my first thought is, Yeah, but God doesn't know what i got to do. Give it three hours? Really? Three hours? God doesn't know what I've got to do. I've got to write sermons. I've got to go to the hospital. I've got to do this. I, three hours? See why I'm intimidated? You probably are too. Prayer. It's a priority to Jesus. And it overcomes my personal preferences. And then finally, prayer prepares us to face temptation. Jesus came back over and over again and said, watch and pray. Your, your flesh is willing to... But the Spirit, I mean, you, you're, just, you're just weak. You're just weak, and I feel that way so many times. Without prayer, we may discover good, but we don't discover God's way. And I hope you understand the, the difference there. There's a difference between what I think is good and what God wants for best. We, we all get that. I know I've said that. I want God's best. How about you? I, I want God's best. How about you? That would require an amen or yeah that's right or thumbs up or you know or my eyes are open or you know punch the person next to you and say hey he's fixed to talk about steve abbey you want to hear this <laughs> okay because i am you see prayer has has to become a habit probably my best friend in the world steve abbey and uh he pastors crossroads fellowship they're doing re really well in spite of him uh <laughs> Steve, when, when we both, we were on staff together at Birdville Baptist Church in Haltom City, he left and went to Maryland. I left and went, came to Waco. And uh, while he was in Maryland, he coached Little League Baseball. It was a way that he could kind of put himself into the community. He coached Little League Baseball, and uh, uh, the baseball coaches came together and said, Steve, you've coached so much and you've been so good. Uh, normally, teams get to have 12 players because you're such a good coach, you're going to get two extra picks. But we're going to pick them for you. Now, anybody that's ever coached Little League knows that's just a setup. That, that's just a setup. You're going to get probably the two worst players out there. And so he just said, okay, because he didn't know better. And so he took on these two players, Alex and Fernie Castano. Alex and Fernie, his name was Fernando. They call him Fernie. Alex and Fernie Castano, they were one year apart, so they played in the same division. And uh, Alex was older and bigger. Fernie was faster and smaller. But what they loved, they loved to fight each other. All the time. It didn't matter. They just loved to fight. Well, Alex and Fernie, I mean, they, they get into it. So Steve had the idea, okay, if Alex is on the mound, because they both had big arms, if Alex is on the mound, Fernie's going to be in center field as far away from him as I can get him. Fernie's on the mound, Alex will be in center field. When they came to the dugout, they had to sit on opposite ends, ends of the bench. That, that was the deal. That, that's how they worked it. Everything was fine because Alex, man, if he pitched, you won. 
They couldn't touch him. But on this day, Alex was pitching. They were winning, and Alex began to slip. He walked one batter, then he walked two batters. After he walked the second batter, Fernie began to let him know about it from center field. <laughs> Talked about how sorry he was. Alex, you can see him turn red in the face. And, man, he threw even harder and even wilder. Steve calls timeout, walks out to the mound, and says, Hey, Alex, look, man, <laughs> don't, let, don't let Fernie get under your skin. I mean, you walk three. You're trying to guide the ball. Just throw the ball, man. You're great. Just throw the ball. They're going to hit it. If they hit it, we're going to catch it. It's all going to work out fine. He said, okay, coach. Then he walked to center field, and he said, Fernie, shut your mouth. I'll pull you out of the game. He walked back to the dugout. Alex pitched, pitched the next pitch, walked the next batter. Fernie let him know about it. Steve yells at Alex and says, Alex, look, just throw the ball. Don't worry. Let him hit it. We want him to hit it. We'll catch it. He throws the ball. Line drive to center field. Fernie catches it on one hop. What Steve didn't notice is as Fernie caught that on one hop, Alex had left the pitcher mound, throw, threw his glove down, and was running to center field. <laughs> then he noticed Fernie running toward Alex. They met right behind second base with the ball still in Fernie's glove. Fernie threw the glove and ball down, and they started trading punches as base runners circled the bases. It was horrible, absolutely horrible. As I told you, Steve was not a good coach. But Steve is a guy who tries to follow Christ, and he coached in the rest of the season, and he got some people in his church to begin to pray for Alex and Fernie by name. You know what happened? One, about a year later, both those boys accepted Christ as Savior. You know what happened after that? Those boys' parents accepted Christ as Savior. Today, Alex has gone to seminary and is pastoring a church and coaching Little League Baseball. <laughs> God has a sense of humor. Yeah, he does. And Fernie, Fernie, he married the sweetest young lady, and they teach Bible to teenagers in their church. You see, God, God works through prayer, works through prayer, because he certainly was going to work through co Steve's coaching. It works through prayer, and I'm, I'm thankful for that. That God answers the prayer of those who will actually pray and spend time in prayer. It all happened because Steve said, would you pray? Would you pray for them by name every day? And God drew them to his heart. As I read this passage, it comes down to one simple thing. Either I pray God's will or I mess up God's will. Did I pray it and follow it? or I just have my opinion, and I mess it up. It really does come that simple. God has something to say about that, and uh, it's, it's very clear, but it comes with a condition. Let me read it for you. If my people, there's the condition, if my people, you are his people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, that's the hard part, we don't like to humble ourselves, we're from Texas, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, let's pray again, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal, I will hear, and I will heal. God hears your prayers. Make prayer a habit. Make it a habit for 2019. See what God does in your life experience. See how God leads you. See the difference it makes. You'll see God use you to bring others to him. You'll see God use you in ways you could never even dream. Will you pray? I pray you will. Let's pray together.